Oh, well, again, good afternoon, my friends, and welcome back to El Monticello. I'm delighted to engage uh, our subject today. Uh, it is uh, of an interest I've had since my youth, uh, and I'm happy to receive your further curiosities and those as well to be directed and moderated by our friend, uh, Mr. Kyle Chattleton. Uh, oh, and I beg your pardon here, you have uh, found me still observing the curiosities that were procured uh, by that expedition led by our countrymen, Captain Weir, Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark. However, uh, before we begin, I would as always ask your acquiescence that I might be heard more clearly and distinctly uh, removing my mask. I would not be presumptuous to do otherwise. I believe in this common decency and respect uh, during these times of the pestilence of nature that besieges. Uh, will it be agreeable with you? Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, there we are, that's much better. Uh, well, if you will, our subject today being the expedition that I commissioned, uh, Lewis and Clark, as you refer to it, the core of discovery, nonetheless. I look forward then to receive your questions. So uh, without a further commentary from myself uh, before those questions, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Chattleton to, to provide the first question from you all. Yes, Mr. Jefferson, uh, how did the idea for the core of discovery come about? Uh, the idea for an expedition to pursue out west uncharted lands, terra incognita, I think has been something in the mind of our earliest settlements, even at the time of Jamestown, when you consider that those who sailed into that Chesapeake Bay back in 1607, then farther up the James River, proceeded even farther up the James and other waterways that confluded into the James River and the Chesapeake uh, in exploration. This was nothing different from what continued uh, even as we continued to migrate westward uh, through the old colony of Virginia. I think I mentioned some time ago, my father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, who was one of the first three or four settlers out in the wilderness. He had been commissioned by the Royal Authority, along with his good friend and neighbor, Colonel Joshua Fry, to survey uncharted lands. In fact, in 1753, I was only 10 years of age, Colonel Fry and my father were commissioned by Royal Governor Dinwiddie uh, to survey far to the west. Uh, and it was during that survey that they then drew up their findings into a very famous map known as the Fried Jefferson map, considered today, and I would venture into the future, as one of the foremost reference maps of early Virginia. Father would return to Shadwell Farm, where I was born and grew up, and regale us with the stories of what he had discovered out west, and so this provoked in me uh, very much an innate curiosity. I remember that uh, near the end of our American Revolution, a relative of mine, General George Walters Clark, one of the seven sons uh, of John Clark III and his wife, Anne Rogers, who coincidentally uh, was related to me uh, through my grandmother Randolph, uh, who was Jane Rogers, uh, the wife of uh, uh, Captain Isham Randolph. I beg your pardon, as you know, Virginians get carried away uh, with their genealogy. But in any respect, um, as former governor of our Commonwealth of Virginia, I suggested to General Clark that, that he venture out west in an exp expedition to discover what lay west of the Blue Ridge Mountains, what would might uh, greet us as we came up to the eastern banks of the Mississippi River and perhaps beyond. But uh, unfortunately, General Rogers, um, somewhat ill and you know, beleaguered with uh, fatigue after our American Revolution, uh, turned down that invitation. Uh, when I was in France serving our nation as Minister Plenipotentiary, I met a rather adventurous gentleman from Connecticut. His name was John Ledyard. And John Ledyard, a man of great whimsy, I'm not going to deny, had this idea that he could actually walk eastward through the kingdoms of Europe the kingdoms of the Russias, venture up to the 
northeast then, cross the straits into Alaska, and then continue his walk eastward across our continent of North America. Well, I was intrigued, and so I provided him papers, letters of introduction to any of the potentates, let alone Her Majesty, uh, Tsarina Catherine the Great. Well, Catherine discovered that Mr. Ledger was venturing through her rushes, and she had him apprehended. She did not care for any foreigner to discover something about her particular country and her people that she did not want to share with the rest of the world. And so Mr. Ledger was brought to Poland and released. Now later, in the year 1793, just before I retired as our Secretary of State, and it was during the time when our government, beleaguered with the yellow fever in Philadelphia, had to go into quarantine in the little village of Germantown, that the American Philosophical Society became intrigued with the idea of supporting a French botanist by the name of Monsieur André Michaud, uh, supported by the American Philosophical Society to venture out west in an expedition, to venture far beyond the Mississippi River is, if possible, and to thereby gather information that would be useful to the American Philosophical Society. The Society drew up a subscription for this expedition. However, within a few months, we discovered that Monsieur Michaud was more interested in gathering information for France than for our nation. And so the entire expedition uh, was aborted. And so then, as you well know later, when I found myself in the office of Chief Magistrate of our nation, that it came to my desk to have the overwhelming joy and curiosity to commission an expedition. Now, firstly, I will let you know that this commission was grounded on the fact that our right to deposit on the island of New Orleans was suspended. We had been trading, trading freely along the Mississippi River when suddenly we learned of a secret treaty between Spain and the people of France that would ultimately retrocede the port of New Orleans back to France and, as we learned later, would allow France to acquire over 830,000 square miles west of the Mississippi River, the territory of Louisiana. This, of course, was a great concern for our protection, safety, and defense on our western borders. We needed a new vent for commerce, uh, another, another vent for trade westward, perhaps to cut through the Stony Mountains and connect with the great Western Ocean. This would be our opportunity. And so as president of our nation, I sought then to commission a military expedition, a military reconnaissance. I went to our Congress in January, I believe it was the 18th, 1803, with a secret message alerting our nation of concerns to the West that we wanted to make sure that the British would not take advantage uh, and state colonies out west. Uh, I forgot to tell you that uh, a Scot by the name of Alexander Mackenzie had already made a successful expedition down from the Canadas uh, out to the Western Ocean uh, on the northwest of this continent. And so we needed to stake our claim as well, and particularly to make friends with many native tribes in that locality. Fortunately, Congress realized our concerns and afforded $2,500 to prepare that expedition. So as you can see, for many, many years, it had been an interest to not only venture and discover what lay west in lands unknown heretofore to man in Western civilization, but also a concern for safety and defense and our peaceable settlement in the future. Next question, Mr. Chattleton. Yes, Mr. Jefferson. What instructions did you give to the leaders? What was their main goal for this expedition? Well, as I've already mentioned, it was our concern first and foremost that next to a scientific observation of the confluences of waterways uh, into a main artery of commerce, uh, and the composition of the soil, the degrees of the climate, and the altitude as we thought would continue to, to heighten as we ventured farther west, that our main concern remained to establish friendship with the native tribes out west, that we might commence a peaceable trade with them. I was brought up here in the west of Virginia 
uh, amongst the Monacan tribe uh, and the Tutelos. And my father brought us up always with the respect uh, to them and their way of life. Uh, never take from the native which we might otherwise peaceably purchase from them. So this was our general interest. And because the right of deposit had been suspended upon the Mississippi River, it might be the Missouri, the great Missouri River, that would then allow us a vent for commerce that would uh, cut through the great Stony Mountains or the Rockies as they're known and connect with the Western Ocean. So for those two purposes essentially, and I say this again beyond the scientific concerns, the purposes of making friends with the natives and finding a Northwest Passage, a water route westward, uh, helped us to provide instructions uh, for Captain Lewis and later the commander that he welcomed to accompany him, uh, Lieutenant William Clark. Your next question, Mr. Chattel. Uh, yes, this question comes from Deborah. She asked Mr. Jefferson, how, uh, how long did it take for reports from the Corps of Discovery to get to you? How long did it take reports to ultimately arrive at, uh, at my desk in the president's house? Well, of course, it would depend, uh, Ms. Deborah, on just exactly where the expedition uh, was finding itself and whether they were still along navigable waterways uh, that any correspondence and any curiosities that they had discovered uh, could make their way more efficiently and expediently down those waterways, uh, ultimately to the uh, Mississippi River. Uh, then, of course, uh, the Ohio River, Monongahela, make their way to uh, Harper's Ferry, from Harper's Ferry, then farther east, uh, back to Washington to me. So I would say, considering that I last saw Captain Lewis on the 5th of July, 1803, well, as he made his way west then to Harper's Ferry to gather together uh, munitions uh, for, the, for the trip, uh, I heard more readily from him. Uh, only several days at the beginning, then several weeks. And then finally, Miss Deborah, as the expedition set out formally in the spring of 1804, uh, setting out, of course, uh, at the mouth of the Missouri River there, at the confluence to the Mississippi, setting out northwards later that winter, the winter of Ought Four and Ought Five, as they reached their winter camp known as Fort Mangan. It took more than several months for me finally to receive information from them. Mr. Chattleton? Yes, the next question is, how and why did you choose Meriwether Lewis to lead the expedition and how did William Clark become involved? How and why Captain Lewis? Well, I, I'll use the word again as I enjoy to use it frequently, uh, not only with respect to who we are as Americans, but also our family bonds, a word that I used in our Declaration of American Independence to remind us of our family bonds, even with Great Britain, though we were at war. Consanguinity, from the Latin word sanguine, blood. Captain Lewis and I are related. Indeed, he was of this particular neighborhood. Uh, we had long been acquainted. Uh, his father was a good friend of mine, Colonel William Lewis, and I continued to lament the fact that, that Colonel Lewis um, passed away before the end of the American Revolution, only one year before the end, and unhappily, uh, he drowned. Uh, while he was astride his horse crossing the Hardware River, but a short distance from Monticello. Uh, it became my charge, if you will, to oversee the education of the two Lewis boys, Reuben and Meriwether, and further consanguinity because uh, their mother, uh, Lucy Meriwether, was of a family long seated out west here uh, in Virginia. In fact, the, the lands that my father acquired, a Shadwell Farm and Tufton Farm and Pantops and Lego and then Monticello were all lands in the immediate vicinity of Merriweather lands. Nicholas Merriweather, in fact. So we were all one of a family, you might say, a, a Virginia network of cousinry. Uh, I followed uh, Captain Lewis's um, exploits out west and was particularly taken with his knowledge of the Native Americans and his knowledge of our army. Because of his knowledge of Indian affairs, because of his knowledge of commanding uh, an American army, I knew he would be best equipped. And furthermore, he was a man of curiosity and innate curiosity for all things in nature. I shared that with him. 
Not a blade of grass grew uninteresting to Captain Lewis anymore, and that grows uninteresting uh, to me. Now then further, uh, Lieutenant Clark was also of a consanguinity I mentioned earlier, uh, that his mother, Ann Rogers, was related to my uh, grandmother, uh, Jane Rogers. Uh, the family was originally settled here in Albemarle County, or originally Goochland County, I should say. That was uh, John Clark III, before they then uh, moved westward into Kentucky. And of course, I knew that, uh, that Lieutenant Clark was born in Carolyn County of Virginia. Now, I commissioned Captain Lewis to lead this expedition solely. He was the one who suggested he needed a co-commander. And so it was Captain Lewis then uh, who brought uh, Lieutenant Clark uh, into the voyage westward. I believe they met up uh, sometime after Lewis uh, left the president's house. I mentioned earlier that it was the 5th of July, all three. Uh, they did not meet uh, at Harper's Ferry. They did not meet in, in Pittsburgh. I think it was down right there in, in St. Louis that they, they got together and maintained their winter camp at Fort River uh, Dubois. Uh, so I think it was a wonderful collaboration between the two of them, uh, a wonderful collaboration among several families all together, and very simply because we could trust one and the other. We could depend upon one and the other, particularly for acquiring information, particularly for pursuing curiosity in scientific objectivity, and particularly for providing a, an ultimate defense for our future settlements westward. Your next question, Mr. Chettle. Um, so presuming that such an expedition would require quite a bit of preparation, what were the preparations necessary for this core of discovery? Well, happily, as I mentioned, the American Philosophical Society earlier, they also proved to be a great support uh, for the expedition to be led by Captain Lewis. And so uh, that spring of 1803, once the Congress had allotted $2,500 for the expedition, uh, Captain Lewis went up to Philadelphia and to be instructed in all of the essential sciences and knowledge uh, that would benefit him on leading this core of discovery. We thought initially about 10 to 12 soldiers would accompany him uh, with he solely as the leader. And you've heard that he decided to uh, welcome Lieutenant Clark upon the voyage and I uh, understand that the expedition then grew to upwards of about uh, 40 some soldiers altogether. And so Captain Lewis was instructed by, um, well, I might refer to them as professors and dons uh, at the uh, college in Philadelphia, Dr. Franklin's College, becoming the University of Pennsylvania, who were also members of the American Philosophical Society. Benjamin Smith Barton uh, oversaw instruction in botany to Captain Lewis. Uh, one Robert Patterson, a professor of mathematics, uh, helped employ Captain Lewis in various knowledge of trigonometry and algebra that would be useful to him in providing calculations on the journey. Caspar uh, uh, Wister, Dr. Wister, and Dr. Benjamin Rush were both instrumental in instructing Captain Lewis uh, in anatomy and medicine. I do believe that Russia's um, pills were of uh, very much use on the expedition. Those were particular pills that help one more easily digest foods that might be, uh, well, um, not so tasteful, shall we say, to the officers. Might provide them an immediate rush of their system. I beg your pardon, that, that uh, <laughs> pun was not necessary. But in any respect, uh, they were very useful. And then I cannot forget uh, Andrew Ellicott. Uh, the great surveyor up in Pennsylvania, uh, was of great utility in teaching Captain Lewis uh, celestial navigation and surveying methods that would be useful to him on, on the voyage as well. Oh, and I cannot forget Mr. Vaughn, John Vaughn. Uh, he was the librarian of the American Philosophical Society, and he was the one who appropriated the uh, uh, chronometer. Uh, chronograph, excuse me, the, the wonderful little timepiece that Lewis carried on his uh, voyage to be able to keep, if you will, the timing of their plotting, of their charting course and, and the like. Uh, also, uh, the surveying equipment was supplied by him. And the idea of an air rifle uh, was something that would be useful as well, that would not startle the natives so much as gunpowder 
uh, from a, a regular rifle and a great iron boat that I helped to design. I should not forget myself in a particular influence here, uh, but I helped to design this iron boat. Uh, Captain Lewis picked it up at Harper's Ferry, uh, thereby covered with skins, all skins. Uh, it would be a bit lighter in the waters to carry their provisions and whatever they might discover. Now, I, I have heard that the iron boat turned not to be so very useful and was uh, discarded along that voyage. Very well. Your next question, Mr. Chattleton. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, were there any other notable members of the expedition? Notable members, yes. I, I dare say I heard of, uh, well, two in particular that, uh, that served the expedition well, uh, particularly in their defense uh, in meeting uh, new Native Americans along the route. Uh, one was, uh, well, the enslaved manservant of Lieutenant Clark, uh, a man named York. York was a man of great physical capacity uh, and as well, I understand, of great mental capacity. Uh, not only was he of great service to Lieutenant Clark, but to many upon that voyage when they were meeting with particular natives they had never known before, that the natives were intrigued with this, this man of color, that they were quite taken with him and his great strength. They looked upon him very much as a god. So you could say that York saved that expedition upon many occasions. The bird woman, that is the English translation of the Shoshone name, Sakagawea or Sacagawea, however you wish to pronounce it, uh, she was the wife of, um, of the Toussaint Charbonneau, a French trapper that came on to the expedition, and, uh, and their little baby, uh, Jean-Baptiste, uh, whom was frequently referred to affectionately as Pomp. Well, she was a welcomed addition, particularly because of her ability to translate with the Indian peoples that were come across. Uh, and in one particular occasion, she saved the entire expedition. Uh, I listened to this diligently as Captain Lewis explained when they were captured by the Shoshones uh, far out west in the journey. And their chief by the name of Kamawea uh, had condemned them all to death. Uh, just at the time that they were going to be inflicted uh, with their mortal wounds, Sakagawea, staring at Chief Kamawea, suddenly flew at his feet, grabbed his legs, exclaiming, my brother, my brother. Here, Chief Kamawea was her brother, from whom she had been extricated in an Indian battle when they were both very young children. And because of that remarkable recognition, Chief Kamawea, believing that this is indeed a, well, a message from the gods, then equipped the expedition with horses and dogs to continue their voyage. You know, you, you simply cannot write fiction like that. Is not fact ever to be the more strange than fiction. And one other, one other important individual, I should say nonetheless, of seamen, Captain Lewis's dog of a particular Newfoundland breed, uh, which he acquired in Pittsburgh, just as he was beginning that expedition. How happy he must have provided uh, that expedition with his particular exploits and his particular ferreting out of curiosities that they might not otherwise have seen. So those are certainly three, next to Captain Lewis and Lieutenant Clark, that I think were most influential in the success of this expedition. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, the Corps met over 40 Native American nations on their journey west. What was your plan or goal for these encounters? Peace. Peace, I say that distinctly. These Native Americans had not been met before by the eye of man east of the Appalachian Mountains. Oh, we had heard of a number of them, of course, the Mandans and the Shoshones. But this will be the opportunity upon first meeting to establish peace with them. And with that in mind, I had long been acquainted with, uh, with the natives and how a friendly bartering with them can establish friendship from the very beginning. I designed a particular peace medal to be gifted to them. And here it is. 
This was very different from the peace medals that I knew when I was growing up. By that I mean the, the peace medals that even my father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, and his good friend, Colonel Joshua Fry, were gifted by the royal governors of Virginia to bestow upon the natives that they met when they proceeded westward on their surveys. I say different because those medals I knew in my youth were oblong, a very curious oblong configuration. Uh, on the obverse of the medal, that is what you would refer to as the front, was the likeness of the particular monarch. Uh, in the experience of my father and Colonel Fry, of course, it would be the monarch of Great Britain, uh, George II. And then, of course, I was familiar with the oblong metal of George III. But on the reverse, well, those oblong metals had a, a small peace pipe and tomahawk in the top that you would assume would be the top. And then down along the reverse of that metal would be scenarios, that is, figures of a white man gifting to the native something that would be useful for their improvement, such as a plow, if you will, or a firelock, or a bolt of cloth. Well, I figured that this was a bit presumptuous and not for us as a new nation if we desired to, to establish peace. And so I redesigned that peace medal to be what the natives would recognize on site as different, but also as representing in a 360 degree configuration, the sun during the day, the moon during the night. When you, uh, when you ascend to the highest point, be it a hill or a little mountain, what you see in 360 degrees of the terrain, and no less the connection of the family of man across the globe. My likeness is here on the obverse to establish with them the idea of a new white father back east, but on the reverse, you may see the crossed peace pipe with a tomahawk, but no presumption of, uh, of a white man gifting unto a native what they think may improve the livelihood of the native. No, it is something that a native and anyone throughout the family of man recognizes as representing peace, two hands clasped in friendship. Is it not remarkable that amongst the natives, their particular greeting of clasping hands has long been known by civilized man for generations. So this, I think, has been something that was most useful to establish friendship. Now, I will tell you that in our efforts to engage a, a peaceable trade with them, I also hope they would understand that if they could relieve the Indian maiden of their drudgery in the cultivation of the soil, for that had long been their habit and custom. Relieve her of that drudgery that she might take on the internal activities of the cultivation of the family and thereby the Indian male be released from his continual roaming on the hunt for the Indian male to come and engage the continual cultivation of the soil. That that balance, if you will, or the dichotomy of attention to the rearing of the native children would prove more secure and beneficial to them uh, over time. That may indeed be a presumption of mine, but I have always thought that security, harmony, and happiness established first in the family in a general consistency, uh, where indeed the woman is continually to see the cultivation of compassion and responsibility in the children while the, the male takes on the external activities uh, could well be a foundation of, of Western civilization. Uh, it is my opinion, and the future may, may prove this to be uh, somewhat incorrect. Uh, your next question. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, what do you remember about the Corps' return? Oh, I was overjoyed. I was overjoyed to hear that they had finally returned. Do you know I mentioned earlier uh, that they reached a winter camp in the winter of uh, 04, 05, uh, known as Fort Mandan. It was about 2,500 miles up the Missouri River, as I can calculate, and uh, I received a shipment of curiosities and maps uh, that did provide that calculation of where they were the winter. But once they then, the next spring of Art 5, set out farther west, 
Once they then had sent that boat back of, uh, well, these great antlers and skulls, the furs that you see here, bones and fossils of creatures we had never seen east of the Appalachians, I heard nothing more from them. That boat uh, sent from Fort Mandan in the spring of Ort Five reached me in Washington City uh, the early part of August, but I heard nothing more from them. I did not know that they had finally made their way to the great Western Ocean, that they had established a winter camp of Ort Five, Ort Six, at what they called Fort Clatsop uh, on the south side of the Great Columbia River or the mouth of the Columbia into the Western Ocean. It was hearing about their return to St. Louis that following year, September of 1806. In fact, I heard it almost simultaneously through a letter sent me by Captain Lewis the 23rd of September and reading about this extraordinary return uh, in the newspapers. Overjoyed, overwhelmed, I could not wait to greet Captain Lewis and Lieutenant Clark and other members of that call discovery in Washington City to engage with them a great fate and dinner uh, there in our nation's capital. And uh, that did finally occur when uh, Captain Lewis returned to Washington City uh, in December. We spent several days during which he regaled me of his experience. And the furthermore, I became concerned that he provide me his written accounts the accounts that he had kept in his journal, let alone what I might read in Lieutenant Clark's journal and the journals of any other of our nation's soldiers uh, who were on that expedition. That has remained my constant concern. However, the Corps of Discovery, as many that did accompany one and the other back to Washington City, enjoyed a great dinner on the 14th of January, uh, 18. Art seven. And that was uh, nearly a year into my, uh, or two years into my second administration. To think of what joy we all held that that expedition had made it safely out west, over 3,000, some say 4,000 miles, returning safely with the loss of only one life. One life, a young man, young Floyd, William Floyd only about 22, 23 years of age, who was carried away by a natural infliction, nothing by which he was harmed upon the journey, and early on in the journey. They tell me they call it now appendicitis. He was buried upon uh, the heights of the Missouri River near a Sioux settlement, uh, which could very well someday become a Sioux city uh, if we persist in our friendship uh, with the natives there. But this is an extraordinary accomplishment. It is a legend. Uh, in this modern world, again, another example that you cannot write fiction like this. Fact will always be stranger than fiction. Another question? Yes, Mr. Jefferson. Alice wants to know which was the greatest artifact that they brought back to you? What was your favorite? My favorite artifact? I would say with a lifelong respect and regard for the natives, that a great buffalo robe that has been painted, if you will, of a, of a scene of, of native battles, various tribes battling amongst themselves, and warm as a, a regard of pride and accomplishment by, by Mandan chieftains, the great sachems of those of those tribes and those people that have been here on this continent long before any European arrived, I would think that that, uh, that buffalo robe has been one of the, the greatest treasures uh, that was provided to me. I'm not going to deny that the, the many curiosities, if you will, of, um, of well, look at these horns, uh, those of great... Uh, great mountain goats and wapitis and the, the bison and buffalo that they discovered out west, all of which I, I placed upon the walls of the president's house there in a great Indian hall, no less than the Indian hall I have here at El Monticello, uh, have intrigued people and have provoked curiosity and will continue to do so as favorite objects of this expedition. And how can we deny that the very story itself 
is amongst the most favorite things that we can bring with us through generations yet unborn. So I, I say that, that what they discovered in over 150 variety of flora never seen before by the eye of man east of the Appalachian Mountains, 175 variety of fauna, animal life never seen before, uh, they are scientific accounts of the composition of the soil, the confluences of various waterways into the great Missouri. Uh, I think of their descriptions of the various natives they encountered uh, and their particular regard for taking the temperature every day, uh, the degrees of the climate, if you will. And, uh, and of course, the recognition that though there were failures, and the Federalist will never let me forget it. The fact they did not discover a Northwest Passage. The Missouri does not cut through the Rocky Mountains as we presumed. There is no efficient mountain passage uh, that can bring one from the Missouri to the Snake River and then the Columbia. They did not discover, as the Federalists are proud to, to point out, uh, the woolly mammoth or great mastodon still stalking the western plains accomplished by giant ground sloths. Yes, that was thought to exist out west. Uh, they did not discover a great mountain of salt, uh, which was supposed to be about two miles wide, two miles high. Well, the Federalists like to, to say that has all been dissolved. No, no, that was not discovered. And uh, Mr. Evans in Philadelphia said them. They might even discover blonde-haired, blue-eyed natives out west, descendants of lost Welchmen who arrived here on this continent long before the English. No, no, but think of what was discovered. Think of the success that we have achieved. Not only a hope to continue to provide peace with the natives out west as we continue to settle there, but also to provide future generations an understanding and a foundation of proper scientific discoveries that will allow that sentiment, settlement to be the more prosperous, the more healthy, and again, the more secure. I think those are the gifts of that expedition. Other questions, Mr. Chattleton? Yes, many of our um, watchers today want to know more about the many seeds and plants that Lewis and Clark sent back to you on their expedition. Well, what I would suggest, lest I stand here and enumerate them all, for that will take us next year at this very time uh, to conclude, if we ever did conclude, I suggest visit us here at Monticello. Visit and see the snow on the mountain that I had planted uh, so successfully out here along the, the flower walk. Uh, come and see the, uh, the auricula, if you will, that bean that was brought back that is so very tasty and a, and a support, if you will, to the meals upon our table. Uh, let alone the mandan corn that was uh, acquired along the way. Uh, I hope that all of this will provide for you to come visit uh, an acknowledgement that Science is never perfect. We continue to work at science for further improvement. And though that we succeeded in this core discovery westward, there is so much more open for scientific exploration. So many, many more seeds that we can continue to discover and use for our benefit, let alone the benefit for preserving the health and the sustenance of man across the globe. Uh, that our Creator has provided us in great bounty here. I say this all sincerely because these are our blessings as Americans. Remember I said as we began our, our time here together this afternoon that this was all terra incognita as we began that exploration westward from the time of my father, from the time of the first settlements along the east coast of this continent. But you know, to all of us through generations yet unborn, so much will continue to remain terra incognita, not only upon our globe, but throughout this universe. Another question? I think that's it, Mr. Jefferson. Well, Mr. Chapleton, I thank you for being with us today. I thank all of you for coming to visit us today. And as I said, please, please return and 
Come see the bounty of nature here on our little mountain and throughout this workhouse of nature. Uh, I, uh, I will now depart because I will tell you that um, the lady folk here at our Monticello have become, um, well, shall we say, a bit offended that I brought back uh, some of the skulls and the, the antlers from the president's house uh, in order to hang them upon the, the walls here of the mansion house. They're not offended at the antlers. antlers. Um, as you can see, they're offended uh, by what is attached to it. Uh, I find this a most magnificent uh, a curiosity, um, almost as if uh, I were to call him Yorick. I'm going to remove the antlers uh, from the skull, and mind you, I will keep both, uh, but the antlers will be that to be hanged in the Indian Hall. Until we meet next again, rest you assured I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.